Send missionaries out. When people go the right way, it's a joyful thing. Amen? Praise God for Mark and me on. Again, 6 o'clock if you want to come. Uh, it's just simply we're going to sit down and eat together and uh, come and share. I want you to turn to Isaiah 59, if you will, this morning, one verse of Scripture. I understand that the road to Harris Hill off of 352 is totally gone. I was talking with Bill this weekend, and he's telling me that the orders that they've had to put in for new hot water tanks is above what they normally thought they would because of the flash flood that hit this week. Basements have been flooded, roads have been eroded, and the enemy has been at work. Amen? But I've got a word for you this morning, and I simply want to tell you the flood is over. Amen? Tell your neighbor your flood is over. Isaiah 59 and verse number 19. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall raise up a standard against him. Let me read the second half of that verse again. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall raise up a standard against him. Father, I pray this morning for the power of the Holy Ghost to permeate this place, saturate this sanctuary and every saint of God seated in the seats here this day. I pray, God, that your Holy Ghost would have free rule and free reign. And, Lord, the enemy would be destroyed and devastated, put to flight and stopped in his tracks. I pray right now, Father, for victory in the name of Jesus. Uh, Lord, I pray, Lord, for, Lord, uh, prosperity in the name of Jesus. Where the enemy has tried to destroy and steal, I pray you'd bring life, uh, an abundant life. God, I pray today, Lord, that your will be done. Anoint this vessel of clay that I may speak as the oracles of God, not a mouthpiece of man, but as, Lord, a spokesman for the Master. God, I pray, Lord, that what you have for this body would be encouraging and uplifting and undergirding and directing. And, Lord, I pray, Lord, your will be done. And we give all the glory and all the praise and all the honor to the only one who deserves it all, Jesus. Amen. Amen. When the enemy comes in like a flood, how many know we do have an enemy? If you didn't think we did, well, just open your eyes. Satan is not your friend. He's your foe. A lot of us entertain him and welcome him into our lives like he's our best buddy. But I want to tell you, you need to keep him out of your life, not let him into your life. He's not coming in to do anything good. He's coming in to do everything bad. Amen. He came to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I, Jesus said, have come that you might have life. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, be sober, be vigilant for your adversary. That's not your ally. That's your adversary. The devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. The Bible said in Ephesians 6, 12 that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. I want you to know Satan doesn't play fair. He's fighting for keeps. Amen. His only purpose, his only purpose is to destroy the saint of God and the work of God and the people of God. Daniel was a man who had a relationship with Jehovah, and he would pray every day. He didn't just pray once every day. He'd pray three times every day, morning, noon, and night. He had three square meals a day of prayer. And one day, the other governors were jealous of how God had blessed him, and they wanted to get him out of the picture, and so they found a way that they might trap him and the only way they could trap him was through his relationship with God because of his prayer life. And they went to the king and they said, you need to put an ordinance that if anyone prays to any other God but your God, they're thrown to the lion's den. We know the story. Amen? Daniel went in and God brought him out. That's a man of miracles. This guy walked with God. 
This guy talked with God. This guy fellowshiped with God. But there was a time in his life when he prayed and God had answered so many of his prayers already he should have thought it was an easy go. But the answer did not come. He prayed for two days, three days, four days, five days, six days. He prayed for one full week and the answer didn't come. He prayed into the second week. He prayed for 14 days. Two weeks went by, but still no response from the Almighty above. And finally, after 21 days, three weeks, the angel came with the answer. And Daniel said, where have you been? And the angel said, I've been wrestling with the prince of Persia. He withstood me. He tried to block me. He tried to stop me from coming. He is against you. He didn't want you to get your answer. God heard you the first day, but I've been in a struggle. I've been in a battle to get the answer to you because the enemy is fighting against you. Sometimes you pray and you wonder where the answer is. I want to tell you the enemy's trying to keep you from getting your answer, but don't you give up. Don't you let go. Don't you release your hands from the horns of the altar. And the battleground that Satan operates in is not in our flesh. It's in our mind. Amen? You've heard the book, The Battleground of the Mind. I think Joyce Myers talks about that. But the battleground is our mind and his weapon is deceit. His weapon is deception. 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen says, Satan comes as an angel of light. He looks good, but he's really evil. When he came to Eve in the garden, Satan or Lucifer was not a snake crawling on, his gr- on the ground. He was not slithering around. I was golfing with some of the guys of the church here last week, and we, we were, came to a pond on the golf course, and I looked down and I saw the biggest snake I have seen in some time. Amen. Mike was there. Mike was probably about that big around, about five or six feet long, black snake, you know, nasty thing. It was ugly. Mike reached out and tapped it, and he just turned around and looked at Mike. I said, well, if he's going to do that, I'm not going to stick around here. But I want to tell you, I don't like snakes. I don't mind spiders, but I hate snakes. But Satan wasn't a slippery, slithering, slimy snake. When he was in the garden to deceive Eve, He was a beautiful creature. How many know Lucifer was the most beautiful of all God's creation? Son of the morning. That's what Lucifer means. He was more beautiful than any sunrise you've ever witnessed in your life. And I've seen some beautiful sunrises. Amen? I've been in the Adirondacks, back in the mountains, along streams with suspended bridges across, you know, the perfect setting, and watch the sunrise and glisten off that water there beside the lean-to where we had parked for the night. I've been down in Hawaii and sat on the veranda and watched the hot ball of fire rise over the Pacific Ocean coming up from out of nowhere and then all of a sudden this blaze of red is so gorgeous. It is spectacular but Satan, Lucifer before he became Satan was more beautiful than any sunrise you have ever witnessed. He doesn't come to put you on alert to frighten you. The way he works is he tries to put you at ease so you relax and let your guard down. You have an enemy that will come against you and any way he can. He'll use subtleties. He'll use snares. He'll slip and slide into places that you didn't think he could get into. And he got into Eve's mind and he got into her thoughts. And the first thing he said to her when he tempted her with that forbidden fruit, he said, hath God said, Did God really say? And he began to introduce doubt into her thinking. He began to cause her to question. Did God really say that? Or did God say it and not mean it? Or what's going on? Let me tell you, the devil knows how to twist the word. Satan tried to get to Christ by quoting scripture. Can you imagine trying to use the word against the word? Because Jesus didn't just write the word. He is the word. And Satan said to him out in the backside of the wilderness, it is written that he'll give his angels charge over thee. And he tried to quote scripture, but Jesus said, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Amen. You see, the devil is sly and he wants to destroy you by getting into your mind and give you lies and tell you things that aren't true, that you'll believe what he says. He wants to dress up things 
He, you know, I think Satan's greatest weapon, you know what I believe his greatest weapon is? Yes, it's deceit, but it comes in the form of religion. Religion is the greatest detriment to revival. I want to tell you, religion doesn't get you to heaven. Salvation does. Redemption does. Being washed in the blood does. And I think one of the greatest weapons Satan uses is the church today. Amen? People think they're doing all right when sometimes they're not doing right at all. And we need to understand what the Word of God is all about. And when the enemy comes in, he not only comes in subtly and sly, sometimes he comes in full bore. Sometimes he doesn't withhold. Sometimes he's not so subtle. Sometimes he's just an on, on an all-out attack. When the enemy comes in like a flood. Uh, we've seen what floods can do. You know what a flood is? A flood is an overabundance. It's a river overflowing its banks. It's superseding its capacity, rising above its limits. It's more than you can contain. That's, that's what a flood does, but uh, that's what a flood is. But do you know what a flood does? One of the things a flood does is it washes out bridges. I remember... Oh, I don't know how many years ago it was now, but on the New York State through the throughway, the Canajahari Creek Bridge went out one night. There were cars traveling at 65, 70 miles an hour across the New York State throughway, and they got to the Canajahari Bridge, and it was dark out, and there was about a 100-foot drop right down into the creek below, and the bridge got washed out, and they didn't know they were driving to their death. Amen. One lady was trying to flag down a, a, a semi-truck driver, and he thought that she was, you know, asking for help or something. He, he gave her the number one signal, drove on, didn't realize she was trying to save his life, and he lost his. You see, when you wipe out bridges, it keeps you from reaching your destination. And when Satan comes in like a flood into your life, he's trying to keep you and deter you from reaching your destination. Amen. The Bible said, or not the Bible, but a quote says, a Christian is a bridge that leads from death unto life and in so doing gets walked on. And when you start to understand that a Christian is a bridge, you find out one of the things Satan does, the flood he comes in, is to try to wipe out personal relationships. He tries to get between people and destroy and devastate. He comes in like a flood to terminate that transportation system to get you to the other side. He doesn't want you to get along with other people. It, it'll keep you from reaching where God wants you to be. When Joshua took over for Moses and he came to the Jordan River, the Bible said that the Jordan overfloweth its banks. He came to a place where Satan was trying to keep him out of his destination, the promised land. And so he sent a flood there in the Jordan River to keep him from accessing and ascertaining and reaching his determined destiny that God had given him from the dawn of time. I want to tell you, Satan doesn't play fair. Not only will he try to destroy personal relationships, but I want to tell you, it not only washes out bridges, but floods will also take homes off their foundations. I remember the 1972 flood here in this area. Some of you may remember that. I remember coming to visit family here, and I remember driving down in Corning and seeing houses, total houses, out in the middle of the street. They weren't on the sidewalk. They were in the road, literally out in the road. We had a flood back in Little Falls in the Mohawk Valley in 2006. And my treasurer's aunt, Aunt Polly, she was 80 years old, lived up on a hillside. And I don't know if she was in the bathroom or where she was, but that flood hit and there was a washout and it took her house right off the foundation, about ready to per just fall down the cliff into the road. And it shifted a couple of feet and she came out and was about to step down but couldn't step down because the house was gone. There was a bar up in Dulgeville that was wiped out, totally gone, washed down the river. And you see what happens is Satan wants to erode and undermine the fabric of society. And when I start thinking about 
the, the, the floods that take homes off their foundations. I look at marriages today, and, and, and you would be alarmed at the number of marriages that are in trouble. Ouch. It's scary what my schedule calls for in terms of dealing with homes that are in trouble. Lives that are going through marriages that are in, in, in it, it's not one or two or three. Probably a good share of my schedule is dealing with homes that are eroding. Isn't that true, Cheryl? You're there when you see the counseling that we do. And I want you to know something. Satan has come in like a flood in these last days. He's trying to destroy personal relationships between brothers and sisters. He's bringing in floods that try to erode relationship between husband and wife, parents and children. He's coming in with everything he's got. You see, the next thing that a flood will do, it will not only, it will not only wipe out bridges, it will not only take homes off their foundations, but it will move you out of your spiritual habitat and destroy lives. I remember as a boy in Norwich, New York, we lived, oh, probably about a mile from the Shenango River. But we would hang out down there. Us kids would always hang out. We'd go fishing or we'd go down there and just play in the farmer fields along the banks of the river. We were in the city, but when you get, you get in the back areas, you found yourself out in pasture land and country. Back in those days, there were more farms than there are today. And what would happen was when the Shenango River would overflow its banks and the water would rise over and come into the pasture lands, when it would recede, it would leave puddles and pools of water in the fields. And when you go down there, it would smell terrible because it would carry the fish that were in the river. And when it overflowed its banks, they would come out into the field where the water was. But when the water receded, they were trapped in the field and they would die and it would reek. It would stink terrible. It would rot. And I want to tell you, Satan is doing that. He's trying to take you out of your spiritual habitat. He's trying to take people out of churches where they're growing. He's doing all he can to destroy people's lives. He's come in like a flood and he's not playing a game. And Floods do damage. Floods do damage. Amen? He'll try to get people, you know, a lot of people come into a revival and they'll come in when the, when the, when the flood of, of God's anointing is there, but then when things settle down again and they get back to normal, they're left in the swamp water because they haven't stayed in the river. They've tried to rely on the overflow, but they haven't got into the flow. And then they end up dying because we're not in revival right now. We're back to the normal, everyday, run-of-the-mill, so to speak, serving Jesus day by day. Sometimes it's not always exciting. Sometimes it just takes commitment. And that's where a strong fish will survive, but a weak fish will die. Satan wants to destroy your life, church. He'll come in like a flood. He'll remove relationships. He'll wipe out families and homes and households. He will, he will cause you to move out of your spiritual habitat, which will destroy your spiritual life. I remember when I was in Hawaii, and I was on the big island. Pastor Yasahara, who was the district superintendent, was showing me where years before there had been a tsunami that came into that city and it wiped out that whole area. How many remember the tsunami of Thailand that happened not long ago? Deanna Richardson is our missionary to Thailand. Her dad was in Jennifer and I's wedding and I've known Deanna since she was a little girl. But Deanna was at that time, I believe in the Philippines, she wasn't there in Thailand, but she went back right after that and told of the devastation and the destruction that came there in Thailand. It wiped out entire cities. And I want to tell you, that's exactly what the devil's trying to do in these last days, wipe out total churches. He's trying to not only split them, he's trying to destroy them and shut them down. And don't you, don't you think anything less, but Satan has targeted Central Assembly of God as well. Amen. His job is to keep us from receiving what God said is ours, and he's come in like a flood. 
Amen. He hasn't withheld anything. He's throwing everything he's got as hard as he can, as fast as he can at everyone he can because he's out to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And that's exactly what floods do. But I've got good news when the enemy comes in like a flood. I want to talk to you about eight different types of spiritual floods. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 24. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch if it were possible they shall deceive the very elect. We are swimming in a world of flood of false doctrine in these days. Amen. Satan is trying to infiltrate the church with all kinds of teachings that are not biblical. Oh, these teachers and these preachers can paint a good picture and they can make it look good, but it's not gospel. Amen. We're living in a flood of cheap grace. You can do whatever you want. God understands. It's all right. Keep on sinning. I want to tell you, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Grace isn't cheap. It costs Christ his life. Amen. Amen. I'm telling you, you talk about revelation grace, revolution grace, they call it today. It's nothing more than, than, uh, than, than cheapening the work Christ did, saying it doesn't matter how you live, all you have to do is just pray a prayer and you're all right. Can I tell you what? You can pray a prayer, but if you don't mean it in your heart and submit your life to Christ after you pray that prayer, you're not going to heaven. You get to heaven when your name's written in the book of life. Amen. He said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but you don't do the things that I say? You can tell me that you love me because you asked me in your heart, but you're not living according to my word. You're not letting me live through you. The things you're doing are against my word. They are sinful practices. And you think you're going to heaven while you continue in sin? Don't think so. They that do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. There has to be a change in your life. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away and all things are become new. And we live in a day of false doctrine. Eternal security is entering the church at a rapid rate. I've never seen how alarmingly fast this doctrine is permeating and penetrating the church. But I'm going to tell you, you can lose your salvation. He'll never leave you, but you can leave him. If he didn't give you a free will, then only if he chose you to go to heaven would you. This predestination, let me tell you, the Bible said he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. How does that play into the fact that he selects a certain few? It's not scriptural. It's not biblical. Amen? For God so loved the world. He didn't die for just a handful. He wouldn't have had to die if he already selected who was going to heaven and who was going to hell. There never would have had to have been a Calvary. Do you understand? But this is being taught and being preached and being peddled from pulpits across the land today. We're in a flood of false doctrine. 2 Timothy 4 and verse 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they'll be turned away from the truth and be turned unto fables. We're not only living in a day where there's a flood of false doctrine, but we're living in a day where there's a flood of spiritual compromise. Seeker sensitivity. God only wants to bless you. He never wants to break you. Let me tell you, the sacrifices of God are a broken and a contrite spirit. Amen. And if you don't fall on the rock and break, the rock will fall on you and you'll be crushed. We don't want to preach messages that tell you that you have a responsibility. We don't want to preach messages that tell you that when you serve God that there are certain requirements that God has. No, we've lowered the standard. We've let it down. We don't care how you live. Just whatever you want from God. He's a big Santa Claus in heaven waiting to grant you your Christmas wish list. I thank God for the signs and wonders and miracles that he does. But don't you think you're entitled to any of it. It's only because of grace. Seeker sensitivity has saturated the Christian church. We want to go hear churches that preach God's going to make you rich, healthy, wealthy, and wise. 
that you're never going to have to go without. You're never going to have to pray in your next meal. You know, let me tell you, some of the most spiritual times of your life is when you learn how to pray in your next meal. Anybody can sing when the sun is shining bright. Boy, it'd be great to be a billionaire, not have any financial worries. But the trouble is, you have other worries when you're rich. The Bible said, they that be rich fall into a snare. Amen? Then you get a lot of relatives you never knew you had. If you won the lottery today, you'd be meeting relatives that you were never introduced to at the family reunion. Everybody's your relative when you get a little money. Don't you think that having money takes your problems away? Nothing wrong with having money. Amen? Nothing wrong with being wealthy. I wish there were a few more wealthy Christians to help support those that aren't so wealthy. Amen? But thank God, God gives money, but He giveth wealth. But don't focus your attention on getting wealthy. You see, today we want to preach on you never have to get sick. Then how are you ever going to die? It's appointed on a man once to die. Then why does the Bible say with his stripes we are healed? You don't need healing. You never got sick. I love these churches that preach divine health, that you never have to get sick, but then testify of the miracle healing they got from cancer or from AIDS or from something else. How did they ever get a miracle healing if they never should have got sick to start with? I believe in divine healing, but I don't preach divine health. But there are a lot of churches that preach all these things because they sound good. They attract people. People want to hear it, and so to draw a crowd. Anybody can draw a crowd, but it takes somebody with a little bit of faithfulness that's going to build a church. Drawing a crowd isn't that hard. Man, I can put up the circus tent, and we'd have this place full. We could have pastor doing somersaults, and we could have Jennifer doing balance beam, and we could... We, I'm going to end up on a slip and slide in about two seconds, I can tell. I, we could turn the church into a circus and draw a crowd. But we're not here to draw a crowd, we're here to please Christ. Not only is there a flood of false doctrine, a flood of spiritual compromise, but James 2.17 says this, even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. We're living in a day of a flood of apathy in the church. Laziness in the church. Amen? We don't want to get involved. We don't want to, everyone else can do it. We'll leave it to somebody else. I, I, I wish I should have gotten that off the internet because years ago you heard the, the one about somebody thought anybody would do it. Anybody thought, you know, that what everybody, but ended up nobody did it. You know? And that's the way it is. We all think someone else is going to take care of it. We're apathetic. Be there Friday night to support the worship team. Just throw that in there. That's free of charge. Amen? Let's not be apathetic. Be here to help on Saturday for, uh, for, a, for a wedding and, and a reception. Let's bless each other. Amen? Let's not curse each other. Let's get, at, let's get rid of the apathy. For faith without works is dead. This is a day where it's hard to find people in the church to do anything. It's, it's not complaining. I'm just telling you that if you're really going to please God, you've got to get activated to the work of the ministry. We're also living in another day of flood. Proverbs 22, 7 says, The rich ruleth over the poor and the borrower is servant to the lender. How many know that we are living in a day where there's a flood of debt? Some of you ought to be shouting on that. Your credit cards are maxed out. You can't even make minimum payment, and if you make minimum payment, you won't get it paid off for 20 more years anyhow. I want to tell you the worst culprit you can get your finances involved in is your credit card. You think that you don't have to pay, but you do. You pay later and you pay more. Putting it on plastic doesn't mean you don't pay with it. You're going to pay with it, you're going to pay for it. Amen, Brother Mike? Hallelujah. I know more people that have got themselves into credit card debt. And the Bible said, oh, no man, anything. Oh, no man, anything. But we're living in a day where people are flooded with debt. 
they want to keep up with the Joneses, so they go out and buy this toy, and then they buy that game, and then they have to go over here and purchase that vacation. How many times, I, I don't know how many people I've known that got in that timeshare nonsense. And when they tried to get out, they couldn't sell it. And they're stuck in a, in a, in a flood of debt because they wanted pleasure instead of priority. And a lot of times it's our greed that gets us into debt. And we're living in a day where there's a flood of debt. I, I, Psalm 42, 5. David said, why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, I will yet praise him, who is the help of my countenance and my God. See, we're also living in a flood of depression. I've never seen more people on pills for depression in my life. They got to have Prozac. They got to have Ritalin. They got to have whatever else comes out on the market for the latest depression drug because they can't cope with the pressures of life. It's not just in the world, it's in the church. Anti-anxiety medication, it rules lives. And let me tell you what anti-anxiety medication does. It makes you more anxious. I, I've talked to people who have been on this stuff and they said, it's just messed up my whole physical body. I'm not the same because of this medication I'm on. But I don't dare stop taking it because I don't know how I'll cope with the stress that I'm under. We're living in a day of depression, a flood of depression. We're also living in a day where there's a flood of division. 1 Corinthians eleven eighteen 18 says, For first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you. And I partly believe it. This is a day where Satan is trying to divide and conquer. I've said this in marriage counseling over and over, but I'll say it to you because it applies in every aspect of life. Whatever divides, destroys. Satan wants to divide us. God wants to unify us. Division is the opposite of unity. And they were in one accord in one place when the Holy Ghost fell. Jesus prayed they might be one as you and I are one, Father. But in the church today, it's, no, you come over to my side because I'm not coming over to your side and we're going to have differences and we're going to let it get between us and because we see things differently, we're going to let that be a crutch and a, and, and, and a, and a, a cross between us and it's going to keep us from fellowshipping with one another. I want to tell you, it's time we got over the division. We're also living in a day where we're flooded by disease. Job chapter 2 and verses 7 and 8. So went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. And he took him a potsherd to scrape himself with all and he sat down among the ashes. Even Job went through disease. There's so many new diseases coming out. There's a new kind of, uh, of tick coming out now, I understand. Every year there's a new tick or a new something or other. There's always a new disease coming. I remember when SARS hit, I was preaching down in Long Island and in the middle of the service, I forgot to turn my phone off, and I got a phone call in the middle of preaching a revival service. It was some pastor from Toronto, Ontario. I'm preaching down in, 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 Hampton, in the Hamptons in Long Island, and he's calling me from Toronto. And he said, can you come preach a revival for me up in Toronto? Our evangelist canceled because the SARS epidemic hit here. And he was afraid to go, afraid he'd get SARS. I said, I'll be there tomorrow. I'll be there on the weekend. I'll finish this crusade. I, I drove six hours home at the last night of that crusade, got in the car early in the morning. I got in late. I got in early in the morning. I got up later early in the morning and took off to Toronto and started preaching that Friday night up in Toronto. I'm not afraid of SARS when I have the blood of Jesus. But that was a new disease. Nobody knew about it. I remember visiting a classmate of mine in a hospital, a young lady back when Legionnaires first came out. And I understand now that's coming back all of a sudden. But I remember visiting her in the hospital with Legionnaires disease. It was a brand new disease. And it was just coming out. There are all kinds of new diseases coming on the, on the, on the, on the horizon every time you turn around. We're living in a day where Satan is flooding us with disease. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 13 says, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. We're also living in a day where Satan is sending a flood of sin in. How I many know sin is getting more sinful? 
How many know that men are becoming more depraved all the time? Their fantasies are getting more and more warped every moment of time. Every, everything you turn around and you see things that you never dreamed you'd see. Things taking place you never thought you'd ever. And they tolerate it. They call good evil and they call evil good. That's the day in which we live. They say it's all right if you go out and, and swap partners. It's all right if you want to be bisexual. It's all right if you want to try this or do that. I want to tell you something. God's Word has something to say about that matter and the soul that sinneth it shall die thank God where sin abounds there does grace much more abound that's the good news Satan has come in like a flood he's come in with false doctrine he's come in with spiritual compromise he's come in with apathy in the church he's come in with debt he's come in with depression he's come in with division he's come in with disease and he's come in with sin but the Bible said but when he comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord, hallelujah, the Holy Ghost, hallelujah. I am Holy Ghost from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. The Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against him. Amen. It's not by might. It's not by power. It's by my Spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Oh, hallelujah. Somebody get a hold of this thing. I, Woo, glory to God. That, that standard, it mean, lifting, lifting up a standard means to abate or to deliver or display a banner. The Spirit of the Lord is speaking of the wind of God. On the day of Pentecost, they heard the sound of what? A rushing mighty wind. They came out of the land of bondage and they came down to the Red Sea and there's the Red Sea in front of them. And, and Moses and the Israelites are saying, what are we going to do now? Mountains and desert on both sides. Pharaoh's army's coming up from the rear guard. What are we going to do? And God said, tell them to go forward. How am I going to go forward when I got a sea in front of me? We can't swim across that. We can't wade across it. We're not going to make it. But the Bible said God sent an east wind. The wind of the Holy Ghost. East is the direction of expectation as lightning flashes from the east to the west. I'm looking up, my redemption draws nigh. But east, amen, he sent an east wind. The Spirit of God bringing expectation to to fruition, it's coming to pass. And he caused that great east wind to part the waters of the Red Sea. And one stood up on one side, another pillar on the other. And they walked through on dry ground. Because when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit, the wind of God, hallelujah. I've got a word, church, what's going to bring victory in Central Assembly of God? It's a move of the Holy Ghost, a fresh wind of the Spirit of God. It's not going to come through our oratorical ability. It's not going to come through our rhetoric. It's not going to come through our performance, our professionalism, our preaching. It's going to come through the anointing of the Holy Ghost. We need a Holy Ghost wake-up call. Thank God the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they're not natural. Psalm 9 and verse 9 said, The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. Psalm 46 and verse 1 says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Psalm 61, 2, when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. The standard, the standard that is above me, that is over me. Hallelujah. You read in the this, in this Gospels the story of, of, of two men that build houses. One built on solid rock, the other built on shifting sand. We know the story of the wise man and the foolish man. Amen? And the wise man built upon a solid rock so that when the floods beat upon that house, amen, it stood because the rock is Christ Jesus. Amen. The man who built on the shifting sand, the rains descended and the floods came and beat upon that house and great was the fall of it because he didn't have a standard to build on. He didn't have a rock solid foundation to be rooted on. He was building on his own selfish ambition. He wanted to lay out at the beach. He wanted to recreate. He didn't want to build on a rock. He wanted to build on the sand. I just heard about a guy who built a sand castle and lived in it. Saved himself a whole lot of rent. And saved himself electricity. I don't know how I held up in the rain, but he, I guess it worked for a while. 
But I think that's a temporary structure. That's not going to be lasting. How many know that God raises up a dam against the overflow of the enemy and God's dam doesn't break? God's standard won't be washed away. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word shall not pass away. We had the flood in 2006 up there in Little Falls in the Mohawk Valley. And there's a, a, a lake up above Utica. And there's a dam, it's called Hinkley Dam. It's Hinkley Reservoir. And that is where Utica gets its water supply. And there's a dam there. And during the flood of 2006, I was talking with some of the, the officials in the area. And they were monitoring that dam because it, there were a couple things that appeared a little shaky. And if that dam had broken, the entire Mohawk Valley would have been wiped out. And they were very nervous and they were watching that dam. And they were keeping an eye on that dam. Because if that dam broke, it'd be Utica, Frankfurt, Illion, Little Falls, Mohawk, all of those little towns and cities and villages and Utica in its entirety would have been washed away. But the dam held firm. But they had to make sure that dam was structurally sound. And I want to tell you something. The Word of God is the dam that keeps the devil from coming in. Amen. You can build on it. it it's going to stand the test. He'll raise up a standard against it. God's standards are high. How many know that? Satan's floods cannot reach God's standard. Amen. You see, what happened during the flood down in New Orleans when New Orleans got flooded? What happened was the dams didn't hold, the levees didn't hold. Amen. And all the flood water came in and wiped them away because the standard didn't hold. I want to tell you, when we lower our standard, the enemy's going to destroy us. We need to hold God's standards high. I gave you eight, eight purposes of floods, eight types of spiritual floods. Now I want to give you eight standards to come against those spiritual floods. 2 Timothy 3.16 says this, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God might be truly finished. We need to raise up the standard of scriptural integrity today to come against the flood of false doctrine. We need to know the Word. People don't want to hear the Word. They want to hear opinions. They want to hear, the Spirit told me. The Spirit of what? Because if it's the Spirit of God, it will line up with the Word of God. If it doesn't line up with the Word of God, it's not the Spirit of God, it's your flesh. And we're living in a day where people go where the wind blows, the wind of false doctrine, not the wind of the Spirit. They'll say, the Spirit told me to do this. Show me in the Bible where it says that you... We need to raise the standard of scriptural integrity... We need to get back to the Word of God. We need to know the truth, and the truth will make us free. You want to stand against the flood of spiritual compromise? You need to raise the standard of scriptural ethics. The Bible said we ought to please God rather than man. Amen? We ought, Acts 5.29, we ought to obey God rather than man. Let's raise the standard of scriptural ethics. Not doing what we want, but doing ethically what He wants. Not taking our own path, not listening to false doctrine, not taking self-centered motives and using them. We need to understand there's a standard that God has called scriptural ethics as well as scriptural integrity. To come against the, the flood of apathy, Haggai chapter 1 and verse 14 says this, and the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and did work in the house of the Lord God of hosts, their God. You need, we, need to, we need to raise the standard of spiritual activity. Amen? 
We need to raise the, 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 the standard of spiritual activity. We need to get involved in the work of God. Everybody's doing what I told you a couple weeks ago. You can't build a full-time a full ministry on part-time people. I will say it again. You can't build a full-time ministry on part-time people. We need to get back involved in the things of God. If we ever want a church to grow, we want God to do what He said He'd do, we got to do our part. And if we aren't doing our part, then let's quit complaining that God's not doing His. You cannot build a full-time ministry on part-time help. We need to raise the standard of spiritual activity. People who are gifted need to operate in their giftings. Amen? Not for a short time, but for the long haul. See, a lot of us will do it over a short period of time, but when we get tired of it, we throw it aside. And we get, that's what happened. They were building the temple, and then all of a sudden they had some opposition. And when things got a little tough and they didn't want to stick with it, they quit. Started building their own houses, doing their own thing, going their own way. And, and, and uh, God said, how long do you dwell in your sealed houses, but my house lies waste? And then he stirred up the spirit of the leadership and stirred up the spirit of the people and they got active and involved again and built the temple that they were supposed to build. We need to learn from the Word of God. If we're going to overcome the flood of debt, we need to raise up a standard of financial freedom. Philippians 4.19, But my God shall supply all my need. Everybody say all. All my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Amen. I want to tell you something. I thank God for the givers in this church. Amen. We thank you for your tithes and your offerings, but you'll never outgive God. And if you will honor him, he will honor you. And then you can say, my God shall supply all my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So devil, you throw everything you have at me. You try to steal this and take that and rob this and, and hoard that. But I'm going to tell you right now, God is my provider. Jehovah Jireh is the one I serve. He won't let me go beyond his care. I got good news for you. If you're swimming in debt, God will get you on the shore of his presence and his purpose if you let him. If we're going to ever overcome the flood of depression, we need to raise up the standard of encouragement. Amen. Amen. Isaiah 61, 1 to 3, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord that he might be glorified and just to give you a little preview that's my text two weeks from today I'm going to be preaching on ten reasons to shout amen, amen. the devil's taking your shout but God wants to give it back amen I won't be here next week come here and Pastor David preach come a week from Wednesday and hear Pastor Brendan teach I'm going to be away for a week but don't you miss it but when I come back, we're going to go to Isaiah 61. We need to lift one another up. We need to encourage one another in the Lord. Amen? If we're ever going to overcome the flood of division, we need to raise up the standard of unity. John 17, 20 and 21. Neither pray I thee for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they may be one. As thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, and they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And then over in 1 Corinthians 12 and 25, it says that there should be no schism, no tear, no rip, no break in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. Amen? We need to get unity back in the church. Get rid of division. And if we're ever going to get rid of the flood of disease, we need to raise up the standard of divine healing. Isaiah 53, 5, he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. How many believe Jesus is still the healer? Amen. How many believe he still touches the body? 
and he restores the mind. How many believe he still cures cancer? How many believe he still can heal the common cold that doctors can't even cure? How many believe he can take allergies and he can take asthma? How many believe that Jesus Christ can take high blood pressure and he can take sugar diabetes? He can take liver problems and lung problems and COPD and everything else. I'm telling you, there's not a sickness he can't heal. When you find yourself battling the enemy and you're sick in your body, plead the blood of Jesus. Amen. He's the healer. If we're ever going to overcome the flood of sin, we need to raise up the standard of righteousness. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 3 to 5. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. That goes against eternal security that says, if you pray the prayer, you can commit fornication, and you can do all these things. When he said, if you do that, you won't go to heaven. Every flood that Satan sends... God has a standard for. Amen? Every flood that Satan sends, when Satan sends in the flood of false doctrine, God raises up a standard of scriptural integrity. When Satan sends in a flood of spiritual compromise, God raises up the standard of scriptural ethics. When Satan comes in like a flood and brings apathy to the body, Christ gives us spiritual activity. When Satan comes in to flood us with debt, Christ comes to give us financial freedom. When Satan comes to give depression, say, uh, Jesus Christ comes to give encouragement. When Satan comes in like a flood to divide, Christ raises up a standard of unity. When Satan comes in like a flood with disease, Christ raises up a standard of healing. And when Satan comes in like a flood with sin, Christ raises up the standard of righteousness. I don't know how Satan has flooded your life. But the reason for the flood is to destroy you. People have said, we have nothing left. Everything's gone have to start all over, don't know where to begin. We're wiped out. Can't afford to pay for the house. We still had mortgage on it and our insurance didn't cover and now we're in trouble. But I want to tell you when Satan comes in to steal and kill, destroy, Jesus comes to give life. And that more abundantly. And I don't know where you're at today. I don't know what kind of a flood you've been experiencing in your life. But it's time to rise up to higher ground where Satan's attacks cannot reach us. One day God brought a flood. Because man's standards had sunk so low, he decided to start over. However, when the rain stopped falling, the waters receded and the flood was finished. He placed a rainbow in the sky as a sign a banner, a standard that he would never destroy the human race through a flood again. For when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of God will be there to raise up a standard against him. It's going to rain on the just and the unjust, the Bible said. Saved or unsaved, we're all going to encounter storms in life. The difference is, are you going to survive the storm? Or are you going to be swallowed up by the storm? Are you going to be sucked in to the floodwaters that Satan's bringing your way? Depression, debt, disease. Apathy, false doctrine, spiritual compromise, sin. 
Are you going to be swallowed up by those flood waters? They'll destroy you. Or are you going to allow God to raise up standard against the flood of the enemy in your life? How many know when temptation comes, it's a flood? When Satan tempts you, he doesn't just tempt you a little. I don't believe in any such thing as a little temptation. Because if it was a little temptation, it wouldn't be a temptation. It's big enough to get your attention that you're thinking about it. And I want to tell you, it may start like a little drop of rain, but soon it's going to be a deluge. And the enemy has come not only to destroy you physically and emotionally, he wants to destroy you spiritually. He wants to flood your life with so much trouble that you give up on God. He wants to flood your life with so much temptation you give up on God. It doesn't matter, be it trouble or temptation, either way, he's coming in like a flood. But I thank God he won't prosper. No weapon. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. And when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against him. What kind of flood have you allowed into your life? Where have you lowered your standard? Where have you let your guard down? Where is Satan getting through to get to you? It's time to get that standard back in place. It's time to raise it high again. Because if you stand firm on the rock Christ, you'll have a house standing when the storm is over. But if you build on the sand that Satan tempts you with, it's all going to come crashing down. He said, without me, you can do nothing. If you try to do it in your own strength, you'll fail. Except the Lord build a house, they labor in vain that build it. Except you do it God's way and not your way. Think you can justify your actions when it doesn't line up with God's word. You're mistaken. Father, I thank you, God, that, Lord, we have been given the word of God that warns us that we're in a war. I thank you, Lord, that we are not caught off guard due to lack of warning. But the scripture teaches us we have an enemy who's dead set on our destruction. And there's days he comes in like a flood. He overwhelms us. He fills us fuller than our capacity can carry. We get hit with so many things. We're careful and troubled about many things. But I thank you that when the enemy comes in to overwhelm us and to overturn us, that God, the Holy Ghost, is there to be a refuge, to be a strong tower. Your name, Lord, is that strong tower. You have given us a way out that we may be able to have an escape and be able to bear it. God, I'm asking this morning that your Holy Ghost would work in our lives afresh and anew. I pray, God, that you would do in us what you need to do in us so you can do through us what you want to do through us. God, I'm asking today for every man, woman, boy, or girl that's struggling right now to keep their head above water. Father, they feel like they're going down for the third time. They feel like they've been inundated with all kinds of problems all kinds of pressure. And God, Father, they're saying, I don't know if I can hold on any longer. I don't know if I can keep afloat any longer. God, let them realize that, Lord, there is an ark. There is a vessel. You are the ark, and if we're in you, we're not going to drown. If we're found in Christ, we're not going to capsize. We're not going to be swallowed up by our environment. God, I'm praying that today, Lord, you just begin to do a supernatural work of stopping the floodwaters of the enemy that have come into lives. 
that division, that breaking down of homes and breaking down of relationships and Lord, that, that work that Satan has come to do. God, I'm asking for a healing bomb of Gilead today. I'm asking for restoration, Lord. I'm asking for mending of broken lives. I'm asking for hope restored where hope had gone. I'm asking today, God, that your spirit would raise up a standard against the floodgates of hell that have come against your people. I thank you, Lord, that we don't have to be destroyed, that we don't have to be devastated. We can be delivered. We can be free. We just look around, Lord, in the natural, and we see how it plays out in the spiritual. We look at homes that have been taken off foundations, and we look at lives that have been taken and ruined and destroyed, and we look at what the flood has done, even a small flood. Satan is doing far worse than that in these days. And Lord, enough is enough. It's time for the flood to recede. It's time for the rain of the Holy Ghost to fall, not the rain of trouble to fall. It's time, Father, for the anointing to destroy yokes and bring deliverance and freedom to captives. It's time for your power to be seen in your people's lives. It's time for victory, not defeat. This morning, I'm just asking God that the Holy Ghost would do far more than I could ever do. I'm asking right now all across this auditorium that your spirit would begin to minister. Have your way, God. Sovereign Lord, have your way. I'm talking to everybody that's been ravaged by the floodwaters of the enemy in your life. It doesn't matter what kind of a flood you're experiencing. It could be physical. It could be relational. It could be emotional. It could be spiritual. But if you're here today and you say, I feel like I'm drowning, Pastor. Satan doesn't let up. It's not that he comes... He keeps coming. And right when I get through one, I find myself facing another. One wave after another wave after another wave. And the accumulations of the waves is stealing my strength. It's causing me to waver. It's weakening my stance. I don't know how much more I can handle. I've reached capacity and I'm going over the top. I've never seen Satan work like he's working in these days. I have never, never seen the work of the enemy to this degree in my life. You talk to any other Christian leader, they're going to tell you the same thing. There has never been a time where Satan has hit so hard so frequently to overwhelm the body of Christ to flood them out till they can't take anymore they can't hold anymore they're gone over their capacity they're overflowing their banks so to all of you that are saying pastor I'm there right now rains one more day in my life I'm it's, I can't hold it if I get hit with one more raindrop from hell 
I won't be able to stand it. I'm telling you there's victory today. And I'm opening this altar and I want to lay my hands on each and every one of you that come to this altar and say, I need God to do something supernatural. I'm believing God for miracles in this place today. I'm believing God for signs and wonders in this service today. If you have to go, you can go quietly, but I am opening this altar right now. Satan has been working as hard as he can. He's been working overtime. And he's gotten in people's minds and he's told them this, you can't survive this one. It's never going to be any different. It's always going to be the same. Why try? Why, why endure? Why hold on? You're going to be wiped out anyhow. Your marriage is going down the tubes anyhow. Why try to serve God? Your friendships are already no good. Don't try to reach out and restore that relationship. Your debt is so high, you're never going to get out of debt. You got so many physical problems in your body, you're never going to walk in health. You're so discouraged and down right now, you think you're ever going to walk in joy and peace and rest. That's a lie of the devil. He's got into your head. Because that's where his battleground is in your thinking, in your mind. But I'm here to tell you, faith needs to replace fear. I'm here to tell you that trust needs to replace doubt. That you need to turn your eyes upon Jesus, not onto the circumstances. You need to look unto him, the author and finisher of your faith, not Satan, the destroyer of your soul. And I want to lay my hand on your head today and I want to pray a prayer of faith and I want to believe God for a miracle in your situation. And if you need a miracle of God, I'm inviting you to come right now. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit, Father, right now, Satan, you're a liar. Satan, you're a thief. But you are defeated. You are defeated in the name of Jesus. You are defeated in the name of Jesus. Lord, every thought that the enemy would put in heart's mind, I cast it down. Every imagination, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Lord, we are here to catch him every thought to the obedience of Christ. Father God, right now, let the Spirit of God have you. You know what's needed in this life and this life. Not only in the Spirit's life, but just the Lord. You know the miracle of God that He's seeking you all right now. God, you withhold no good thing.
of your prayer.